Praise God. You may be seated this morning. I want to encourage you to continue to, to pray. God is good. God's faithful. I have some. Yeah, thank you. I'm checking to see if I got tissues. Yeah, I always got to have tissues. You know me. <laughs> well, as we turn to the Word today, I encourage you to pull out your Bibles, pull out your note sheets, okay? We're going to uh, jump into the second half of Romans chapter 14. I, I do have to say this, you know, that hits home so much for us as a family, not only because we're connected with YWAM, we're also connected with Tanzania. In fact, we have a team from here going out a week from Friday going to Tanzania. And uh, you can hear something like this, and you say, oh man, oh, well, that's kind of dangerous. Listen, something like this could happen anywhere, right? We know the tragedy could happen anywhere. But I thank God that these young people were serving the Lord, amen, and that they're giving their lives in that way. And hopefully it'll challenge and encourage us. We, again, do have a missions team going out a week from Friday. Uh, maybe you smelt the smell coming in. Maybe you already got your empanadas, but I encourage you after service, go grab a few empanadas. Let's help get the team there, amen. And uh, trusting the work that they continue to do with the school there, with uh, Kevin and Santa Reese in Tanzania, is going to be encouraged. It's going to be built up. Uh, as my wife leads that team, I think there's seven going, um, and we're going to pray for them uh, next week as they, they, they prepare to head out, all right? Romans chapter uh, 14, again, we're going to look at the second half, and we're going to look today at verses 13 through 23, and our passage is going to begin with this word, therefore, and I, I trust you know this that by now, that any time you see the word, therefore, you should ask, what is the therefore, therefore, good, all right? So in other words, we're going to kind of go back, and I, I want to uh, look at the, go back a little bit before we jump into our text today. Uh, I know I've expressed through these last few months that this last section of Romans from uh, chapter 12 on through chapter 16 becomes very practical theology, okay? Paul's going to say, in light of all that he shared, here's how you live out the Christian life. And he talked about the gifts, the operation of the gifts within the church. He's talked about a number of things. But the overall idea that he's sharing here is that we are to walk in love and we're to act in love towards each other. We're called to love one another within the body of Christ because we understand we're not all at the same place in our walk with the Lord, amen? We're, we're not all at the same place, and, and yet, I could say this, every one of us, every single one of us has a long, long way to go to be like Christ. And so we're called to love one another. We're called to be patient with each other. I encourage you, be as patient with others as Christ has been with you. Now, last week at the beginning of chapter 14, Paul described the one who is weak in the faith. He says this, as for the one who is weak in the faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. This is a new term in the book of Romans, the term weak in faith. And I don't know if anyone would want to own that description today. Right? It doesn't sound like something to, to be proud of. I don't think any of us would want to admit, yeah, that's me, I'm weak in the faith. And so who is Paul talking about here? Well, I would say it this way. A weak Christian is one who, or one who is weak in the faith is one who has very strong convictions over non-salvation issues. One who has very strong convictions over non-salvation issues, okay? I've often seen it in the lives of those who are new believers. They come to the Lord and they're passionate about the things of God. Maybe they, they've read something or they they talk to someone who's focused on one issue, and because they're so passionate about serving God, they take that thing, and it's a peripheral thing, but they make it a central thing. Maybe they're told, this is the translation of Scripture that you must read, and here's why, right? And so all of a sudden, that one thing becomes so important that it actually becomes a distraction to what is central. Maybe it's someone who's new in the faith, they begin to hear different opinions about the end times, and they're just ready, man. I'm ready to jump in the book of Revelation. Let's talk pre-trib, post-trib, right? They, they want to talk about the millennial reign or signs of the end of the time, and so they'll get caught up in all these conversations that are not essential to salvation. Listen, in one sense, I don't care if you're pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib, or even know what the tribs mean, okay? We can have some understanding of this from the book of Revelation, right, in regards to what is going to take place, but thankfully, our salvation is not dependent upon our eschatology. Paul says if someone is weak in their faith, they're caught up in all these, these minor issues. They're so fixated on certain topics that those topics grow in their mind to where they eclipse everything else. What do you do with these people? Well, he says this, you welcome them and you don't debate them. <laughs> you welcome them and you don't debate them. You welcome them, but not so that you can argue with them. Don't befriend them thinking, man, I'm going to straighten this person out. 
right? Just wait until I show them a proof text on this. I got a book that they need to read, right? You know, there have been times when I've seen a new believer come into the church and someone in the church begins to gravitate toward them and to kind of disciple them, but I, I get a little worried because I know that person always focuses on secondary issues. Listen, if you're involved in the life of a new believer, if you're investing your life into their lives, make sure they know the gospel first, okay? Like, take them to the gospel of John before you take them to a study on the book of Revelation. Are you with me today? Right? Paul, Paul would say, we're not to argue or divide over disputable matters. And one of the things that Paul points to at the beginning of chapter 14, as Pastor Floyd shared last week, is this issue of diet. And so he speaks of, uh, of individuals who've chosen not to eat meat. To me, that's kind of crazy, right? But they've chosen not to eat meat. Now, here's why this matters. Because many in the church in Rome are coming out of a pagan background. There were many different religions and cults that would sacrifice animals on an altar. And, and some of the meat from those sacrifices did not get completely burned up on the altar. And so it was sent to the meat market. And so you could buy meat that was sacrificed to idols. And here's the thing. You didn't have to guess if it was sacrificed to idols. It, you knew it was sacrificed to idols because they actually marketed it that way, okay? Think about it. No one wants to give a cheap sacrifice. They would give the best cut of meat. And so when the, the seller sold the meat, he's anxious to tell you, hey, come get your, your meat that's sacrificed to idols. Come get your sacrificial meat because this is a choice cut. Now, some of the early Christians believed that it was wrong to eat meat that had been uh, sacrificed or dedicated to a pagan god. And can I just say, I think that's somewhat understandable, right? I mean, think about it for a moment. If there were satanic rituals taking place down on Main Street, and they're sacrificing some meat to demons, and someone offered you some of that meat, you may be like, I I'm good, right? Uh, I'm vegetarian, at least today, I'm vegetarian, right? Or if you were down at, at Stop and Shop, and you're picking up some steaks for the barbecue, and it was clear that that meat had been sacrificed to a pagan idol, you might be a little bit hesitant to pick it up. Or maybe you're on the other side, you would say, you know what? If it's a good piece of meat, especially if it's on sale, right, I'm picking it up because that's just a T-bone steak, right? I'm just going to throw it in my cart. Like, I'll, I'll just cook it. I'll cook it a little bit more. I'll, I'll make it holy. Some of you already eat well-done steaks. That is sacrilegious to me. <laughs> but you do that, right? But imagine for a moment you, you bought that meat. You got no issue with it. And you invite a family from the church over for dinner to have a little bit of barbecue, right? Can you see what's coming, right? And so you welcome your guests. They say, perfect timing. Man, I got some steaks on the grill. They're going to be amazing. And they ask you, well, I got to ask, was that meat that was sacrificed to idols? And you're like, yeah, of course it is. I mean, we only get the best stuff here, man. That's a great cut of meat, right? And they say to you, well, I'm sorry. I can't eat that meat. That's wrong. So this was one of the challenges that the early church was facing. And, and it was causing great division. Now, there's a couple of things that I, I find very interesting in all of this. First of all, Paul describes the one who does not eat meat, the one who abstains is the one who's weak in faith. We would think of it the other way around, right? Like the one who does not eat, that guy much, must be much more spiritual. Uh, I'm sure the vegetarian guy thought, I'm the more spiritual one because I don't eat meat. But Paul calls him weak. But the second thing I find interesting is Paul's solution to the problem. It's there in verse 3. He says, let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. And let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Now, before we jump into the second half of chapter 14, I want you to see that in that first half, Paul does not focus on who's right and who's wrong. And I'm pretty sure that bothered Paul's readers, because when it comes to disputable matters like this, we always want to know who's right, right? Paul, can you, you talk to this guy and let him know that I'm right and he's wrong, right? He needs to know that he's wrong about this because that's what we're about as Christians. At times, it's about being right even at the expense of others. And so what do we do over these disputable matters? So often we go to the Bible and we say, well, here's my proof text and let me hit you over the head with my proof text and let me show you you're wrong, right? But Paul doesn't stop to address who's right and who's wrong. Really, what he addresses is this area of judging. He says, you guys just need to stop judging each other. Listen, if your brother feels free to eat that kind of meat, stop criticizing him. And if you eat that meat, stop judging your brother who doesn't eat that meat. That's really the issue for Paul. And again, the reason that he says it's not right to judge your brother is because this is a disputable matter. Okay, It's, it's a gray area, if you will. It's not a matter involving salvation. Like, you can eat the meat and still be saved. Are you with me? And, and so he says, who are you 
to pass judgment on the servant of another. Ultimately, that believer who you disagree with over that issue is not your servant. You're not his master. The Lord is his master, and he needs to answer to the Lord. And so at the beginning of chapter 14, he's been talking about eating meat or not eating meat. There's discussions about Sabbath day. What is the right Sabbath day? Does it stay Saturday or is it now Sunday, right? Again, these are disputable matters. Now, picking it up there in verse 13, therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer. So let's cut that out. But rather decide never to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of a brother. As believers in Jesus Christ, if we are walking by the Spirit, we need to leave uh, judgment on these discernible matters, disputable matters to God, okay? We're not to put ourselves in the place of a judge. Again, the focus here is on disputable matters. Now, if there is a brother or sister who's involved in adultery or sexual immorality, and I confront them on that area, and I say, listen, your life is off. We need to get this, this straightened out in your life, right? This is not lining up with how God would have you to live. It would be out of place for them to grab this scripture and say, who are you to judge another man's servant, right? Don't judge me. I would say, no, you've got that wrong because it, that has to do with clear scriptural principles that are being violated. Uh, sexual immorality is not a disputable matter, okay? I can show you clearly in the word of God what the word of God says. And so when I address something like that with a brother or sister, I'm not actually judging. It's the word of God that's doing the judging. Are you with me? I can point to scripture like 1 Corinthians 6, 18, flee or, or run away from sexual immorality. But again, Paul is addressing issues that, that scripture does not speak to either specifically or in principle. Now, one example of this, I know our, some of our community groups met this week and they were talking about some examples of this. One example of this would be your opinion on alcohol. Now, originally, this church, when it was founded, was predominantly a Scandinavian church. It was a bunch of Norwegians, and they, they hired my father as the, the lead pastor. He was a Swede, and it got really diverse real quick, right? Swedes and Norwegians, right? And that's how it all started. And I don't know if there was much discussion in the beginning about whether you could drink alcohol or not. There was, as far as I know, there wasn't too much of that. But then the Italians came. <laughs> and the Italians brought their wine, right? More of a, a cultural thing, right? Now, Scripture, I want to be clear, does encourage us not to get drunk with wine. I want to be very clear about that. Like, you should never be mastered by any substance. I won't say any consumption of alcohol is wrong. I'm not going to say that. I will say that if you are drinking to the point where it's affecting your life and your relationships, you're being mastered by that thing and you need to stop, right? If you've struggled with alcoholism in the past, run from it, okay? But, but think about it this way. If you have a brother or sister from church over for dinner and you know ahead of time that they think you shouldn't drink, then can I just say, please don't offer them a glass of wine, it's probably not even a good idea to bring the issue up, right? There's far better things you can talk about. And I would encourage you, hey, if, if that's your perspective, go ahead and have a glass of wine with your meal when you're alone, but don't insist on that freedom with those who disagree, right? So I, I know from experience growing up in the church, pastor's kid, I, I know there will always be those in the church that, that, that want me as a pastor to say, that's wrong. Pastor, you need to tell them. You better tell them that's wrong, right? Or, or they're so focused on this one issue that if, if we don't say that's wrong, they're going to go somewhere else. And so here's our stance as a church. You'll hear about it in our membership class. If you go through our membership class, we say this, in essentials, unity. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, tolerance. In all things, the preeminence of Christ. In non-essentials, tolerance. In all things, the preeminence of Christ. I said a few weeks back that we are called to unity, not uniformity. We gather together in unity so that with one heart and, and one mouth, we can glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we do not compromise on the essentials. You can read our statement of faith, and every official member here signs off on the statement of faith that says, we believe, right? And so we're unified around who Jesus is. We're unified around what he has done for us. We're unified around our understanding that salvation is by faith alone. We're, we're unified around our, our passion for others to hear the gospel. But because we come from different backgrounds and teachings, I've got to tell you, in this church, you will find a variety of standards. You'll find a variety of opinions of right and wrong over the non-essentials. Things like, is it okay for a woman to wear makeup or jewelry or how much, right? Is it okay for Christians to watch certain movies? Is it okay for, for a Christian to go dancing or, or, or to celebrate certain 
holidays, right? And there are some who would love for all of these standards to be written out and, and etched in stone, but we have decided not to do that. Because if we impose all kinds of regulations as a church, it would remove from you that individual responsibility to seek the Lord. It would remove from you the responsibility to study the Scripture and to hear from the Spirit of God as to what He would have you to do. Because many of these things, they're, they're not one size fits all. And so we take a route that may be a little more dangerous, but we believe ultimately it's more helpful. We teach principles from the Word of God rather than a list of do's and don'ts. Because if I gave you my opinion on everything, like if the elders set a standard for everything around all these controversial issues and Elder Joe brought down the tablets of stone, right, and <laughs> presented them to you, I got to say ultimately there would be a lot more division in the church and there would be a lot more disharmony. And, and Paul gives us this idea here of a stumbling block. And, and, and really it can be something that we say or something that we do that causes another one who is weak in the faith to go against their convictions. And so, again, someone's very convicted of something, and we come along and, you know, we want to straighten them out, right? And, and because we don't want them to, to stumble over this issue, we don't want them to get hyper-focused on this issue, we debate them on the issue, and they become even more focused on the issue, and it's possible in that process that we can cause them to stumble. And so rather than trying to challenge someone's convictions around disputable matters, you should encourage them to live up to their personal convictions. Listen, it is not your job to change everyone's mind over these little issues. Instead, you need to trust the Holy Spirit to change a person's viewpoint if it needs to be changed. It's the Holy, hear me, it's the Holy Spirit's job, it's not yours. When we encourage a person, though, to, to compromise on their convictions, what we're saying is, well, it's unimportant for you to stand for what you believe, and I don't ever want to do that. And so in the early church, the, the Gentiles are used to sacrificing animals to pagan gods, to, to demons, really, and, and they're having a feast with that meat. Now, many of, of these new converts would right away, understand, they would connect eating meat with idolatry. I have a, a good friend who is an amazing graffiti artist. He uh, travels the world as part of an organization called Gospel Graffiti and uses his giftings uh, for the Lord. Actually, if you walk up to G Kids Clubhouse in the left stairwell, you'll see some of his early work from years back when he was here. But I remember when my wife and I were youth pastoring out in San Francisco, there was a, a young man that came to the Lord, and he came out of this background of graffiti. Like, he was an amazing graffiti artist, you know. And uh, he was doing graffiti, but not the legal way, kind of, you know, find a spot, run from the cops, that whole deal, right? And so he gets saved, and I'm like, this is amazing. I'm going to connect him with my friend who's a believer. The two of them are going to do just, like, amazing things together. It's going to be awesome. And, and, and so I even was like, hey, we got this wall in the youth room. You want, guys want to, like, hit it up, man? I'll give you permission. Like, do what you want to do, right? And this young kid, he wanted nothing to do with it. I'm like, what, what's the deal? And I was talking to my friend, and he said he's going to need some time. Give him some space because very likely early on, whenever he smells that smell of spray paint, it's going to take his mind back to where he used to be, right? It's going to take him back to running from the cops and take him back to a life that he does not want to remember, right? And, and so, you know, when you think about it, the early church, again, there's that smell of that meat and there's the knowing that it was food sacrificed to idols and their mind is going back to a place that, that they don't want to go to. And then you got the mature believer saying, come on, get over it, dude. It's, it's, it's just meat, right? Again, this conflict. But look into what Paul says in verse 14. He says, I know, I, I'm persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. Now, if, if you're on the side of eating meat, you're like, see, even Paul says we can eat it, right? But that's not the point. He says, but it is unclean for the one who thinks it is unclean. If Paul's going to take a side, he's kind of taking a side here, right? But regardless of the argument, consuming the meat, again, probably brought up these images of pagan worship in the new believer's mind. And, and so he can't even watch his brother eat that meat because it's offensive to him. I want to be very clear, though, that Paul is not stating here that truth is relative, okay? He's not saying, well, something could be true for you and not for someone else. His focus is on the conscience. And he says in these areas, the most important thing that is that you would respond to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Look what he says there in verse 15. He says, for if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. Wow. If your brother's grieved by what you eat, you're no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. 
if we are walking in love, we will never do anything to intentionally offend a brother or sister in Christ. Now, I, I know that word destroy, that sounds like a harsh word, right? But I'm, I'm sure many of you know of someone who's walked away from the faith because they were completely offended by what some other believer did or what they said, right? Listen, if your words and your actions within the church are careless and they cause someone to walk away from the church or away from the Christian faith, your heart should be grieved. And the reality is if we're going to walk in the spirit, we're going to walk in love. That, that new believer may be so focused on certain words or certain actions, but the mature believer needs to be aware of the sensitivities of others so that they can draw them to Christ rather than driving them away. Yes, that new Christian may be so focused on the externals rather than the eternals, but that simple expression, just think about it, destroy the one for whom Christ has died. Wow. That should cause us all to pause and to think. What a tragedy it would be if some of our actions caused someone to be repelled from the fellowship of believers. If we have a personal conviction that we just need to argue about, and it's so important that we prove that we're right, if that's the case, i got to say, you need to check your heart. Instead, we need to walk in love and we need to yield to the Holy Spirit. We need to keep our eyes on eternity. Verse 16, so do not let what you regard as good to be spoken of as evil. The focus there, I think, is on the freedom that, that I have in Christ, right? Paul knew, again, all the foods were good. They were sanctified by prayer. He also had insight into, into the scripture, into the word of God, that some could not accept. Yet, yet there were things that he regarded as good that he could not share with others, especially young believers. If he shared those good things with those who were not ready to receive them, he might cause what he found to be good to be spoken of as evil. Listen, if we're walking in love, if we are sensitive to the Holy Spirit and to the consciences of others, we will not let what we regard as good to be spoken of as evil. If there's something that we understand, if there's something that we're convicted of by the Holy Spirit, but we begin to argue about that thing, again, a disputable matter, and we begin to dispute it, <laughs> Listen, when it becomes an argument and we begin to question the motives of other believers and we say things like, really, he went there or he watched that or he did that. I don't even know if he's saved or she's saved. Listen, when we do that, we're moving from building each other up to separating ourselves. That's why it's good to discern when a discussion or a debate becomes personal. At that point, we need to agree to disagree, and then we need to go back to the essentials of our faith, which we can all agree on, amen? Amen. You see, if we come back to the essentials of our faith, we find unity there instead of driving people to one extreme or another. Now, look what he says in verse 17. He says, for the kingdom of God, here's what it's about. It's not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Very simply, the kingdom of God is not about the Mosaic laws any longer. It's not about any outward thing. It's not about what kind of food you eat or can eat or can't eat, right? According to Luke chapter 17, the kingdom of God is within. In other words, it's about a heart that's made right with God because of the sacrifice of Jesus. The kingdom of God is about living a life of gratitude for all that Christ has done for you. It's a life full of the Spirit and full of the fruit of the Spirit. And so very simply, if your actions with other believers don't line up with the fruit of the Spirit, then you're going back to that old nature. And, and so the reminder is we're not going to focus on outward things. We're going to focus on the heart. The kingdom of God is not about externals. It is about eternals. Verse 18, whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by man. If we can serve the Lord from a heart that is made right with God, if the fruit of the Spirit is evident in our lives, we'll actually be approved by man. Listen, there will always be those who are offended by our lives but most people will appreciate the fruit of the Spirit at work in your life. And when they see those things, then all of a sudden it gives you uh, the right to be heard. Verse 19, so then, let us pursue, let us run after what makes for peace and mutual upbuilding. I love that. Pursue what makes for peace. Let's aim to build one another up in Christ. Like, let's run hard after those things. We need to recognize this, church, that our ego, the ego is a very fragile thing, Right? And, and we all want to be right, okay? Even if you're arguing with me over that statement, that's just you wanting to be right, right? But, but we argue over these disputable matters. When we do that, it does not make for peace. 
There's no mutual upbuilding because in our desire to be right, so often we'll bring an ad hominem attack, right? And we'll start to attack the character of that other person. Well, I can tell you why they're not right. Did you see how they did this? And you, uh, right? We'll begin to attack that person. And so we'll begin to tear down. And, and so Paul's saying, let's set aside arguments over disputable matters. Verse 20, do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean. Here he goes again. He says, everything is clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. If we see someone that is new to the faith or, or growing in an understanding of faith, but we see some minor issue and we're like, man, I got to go after that issue, right? We can destroy the work of God in someone's life. Now, do I believe God is sovereign? Yes. I believe he's going to save who he's going to save. And, and yes, your theology may be perfect. And if it is, let's talk about pride. Um, <laughs> But if you insist on pushing your opinions on minor doctrines on somebody who's new in the faith, before they're ready to hear all about that, it will cause them to stumble. Even Jesus said in John chapter 16 to his disciples, he said, there's many things I, I want to say to you, but, but you're not ready to hear that, right? And, and so you see, it takes discernment from the Holy Spirit, not only to know what to say, but when to say it. And Paul tells us everything is clean. He's reminding us, again, th this discussion is not centered around that which is sinful. It's focused on disputable freedoms, okay, disputable matters. And even when we have freedom, hear me, even when we have liberty in something, that thing can put us into to bondage if we overindulge in it. If you cannot control a freedom, then that freedom can enslave you and be sinful to you. Verse 21, it is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. Very simply, we should hold back from doing anything that might cause our brother to stumble. That's what it means to walk in love. We shouldn't start that conversation over that controversial doctrine if it's just going to end up in an argument, right? I think within the body of Christ, we need to ask ourselves this question more frequently, right? Is what I'm about to say going to edify or build others up, or is it going to bring division? Is what I'm about to say, is it coming from a place of pride that exalts me, that makes me look better, or is it something that encourages the church? Verse 22, the faith you have, keep between yourself and God. Now, he's not talking about saving faith there, obviously, right? Paul would say, you need to share your faith. But he's saying, this faith, when it comes to these disputable matters, keep it between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. The freedoms that God has given you in these disputable matters are really between you and God. And so don't try to put your convictions on someone else. Don't try to take someone else's convictions and, and make them your own. Instead, study the word of God. Be in the word. Be in prayer. You should know what you believe and why you believe it. But if that belief over a non-essential issue causes a young believer to stumble, then it would be better that you keep it between yourself and God. At the end of chapter 12, I encourage you to, to memorize the, the last verse of chapter 12, Romans 12, 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Okay, the last verse of chapter 13, another great verse to memorize, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. And the last verse of chapter 14, I think it's another one we need to memorize. Because I find that a lot of believers are, are, are very confused about the will of God in their lives. And so when the scripture is not clear on a matter, we, we need to ask, is there peace or is there conviction that comes from the Holy Spirit? And so when you're seeking the will of God over these things, remember verse 23, but whoever doubts is condemned if he eats because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. What he's saying there is if I'm doing someone, something that, that someone else tells me is right, but the Holy Spirit convicts me that it's wrong, if I keep doing that thing, I'm rebelling against the Holy Spirit. If, if you can't do it in faith, then it's sin. Remember, we're not talking about things that are clear within Scripture, but rather those questionable areas where you and I, we need to discern the will of God and we need to hear his voice. A and our Father knows when we're acting according to our convictions by faith. He also knows when we're acting in rebellion because we just want to do something so bad even though the Holy Spirit's convicting us we shouldn't do it, right? Anyone with me? Anyone want to admit that, right? right? So often people come to me for counsel and they're not sure if they should do this thing or, or, or that thing. 
And again, if it's not something that's prohibited from Scripture, then there's freedom. But I also encourage them, well, which of these two options is most pleasing to God? Like, which action, which pathway do you feel like would please the Lord? Be- because when your heart is to please your Father, when, when, you're, when that's your desire, but you don't know exactly what God wants you to do, then you're free to make that choice, right? And as you do that, that's actually an act of faith. If your heart is to please the Lord and you make the wrong choice, God is going to reveal that to you. Because even more than you want to know God's will for your life, I believe he desires to reveal it to you. And so as we come to the end of this chapter, I want to challenge you today with what Paul is saying here. He's encouraged us, right, that church, we need to walk in love with each other. We need to be very careful not to offend a weaker brother, right, because of our freedoms. And and that means we need to be ready to say, you know what, I can set my freedom aside in that area. It's not that important. Yes, I may be free to do that thing, but I can set it aside because I don't want to destroy the work of God in the one for whom Christ has died. And, And when we do that, we are considering the needs of others before ourselves. When we, are do, when we do that, we are uh, pursuing what makes for peace. When we do that, we are building each other up together. Now, look back at verse 22 before we close here. Because I don't want you to miss what Paul says there. Because he says blessed, or you could say happy, is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. Really, he's talking about a situation there where the Holy Spirit has spoken to a believer's heart. And he said, you know what? That thing, that's not for you. Paul says you'll be happy if you don't condemn yourself by what you approve. Or let me turn that around. If we do not condemn ourselves by what we approve, we will be happy, right? And so, yes, in this passage, we have this idea that there certainly are disputable matters in the Christian life. And, yes, we we don't want to cause our, our brother to stumble by what we approve. But I also want you to see this as we close. If you are approving of something that God is condemning, the Holy Spirit's been highlighting something in your life, and he's saying, you know what, you need to move away from that. You need to be done with that. You need to be done with that. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's an action that he just said, that's not for you. Now, you could argue with the Holy Spirit, (laughs) and you could say, well, Lord, I don't see that clearly in Scripture, so I don't know if that's you, right? Or, or Lord, I, 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 I know other people do that thing, right? Or it would be really hard to to stop doing that thing, Lord. And so I I know you know how hard it is, and so I'm just not going to do it. Here's the reality. If you approve something in your life that God condemns, you're not going to be a very happy Christian. See, a lot of believers don't know the joy of verse 22 because there are things that God is challenging them to give up or release and let go of, and yet they go on living and approving of them. And as they're approving of them, they're actually condemning themselves. And so it's not simply a matter of that thing is clearly good or clearly bad. It it has to be enough that God has spoken to us. And so each one of us has to ask God, Lord, what are some areas in my life? What is there that that might be hindering me from a closer walk with you? If you want to know the joy, if you want to know the happiness that, that comes by not condemning yourself by what you approve, then you need to ask the Lord and you need to live by faith. And can I just say, it's going to take faith to live like that. Because very often, we cling to things that the Lord wants us to let go of. We cling to them because we're convinced that thing is going to bring me joy. That thing's going to bring me happiness. But I believe the Lord would want to challenge some of you today that you're actually going to be happier following him. (laughs) That you're actually going to be happier if, if you can release that thing. You're actually going to be happier being closer to him. And so as we close today, I want you to take a moment. Maybe the Holy Spirit's highlighting something in your life right now. and It's putting that spotlight on. You've been running from the spotlight for a while. <laughs> there's, there's something that he's been convicting you of, and you've been talking your way out of it. Maybe you said, well, Lord, I, I know some very spiritual people who do that thing, but God's not speaking to them. He's speaking to you. And there's a race that you need to run. There's something that God has called you to that he has not called everyone to. And so I want to challenge you to respond to the leading of the Holy Spirit because ultimately I want you to know the joy, the happiness that comes from following the Lord completely, following him completely, even in these disputable matters. Because again, Paul says, whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. You know, I truly believe this, that when the Lord fills us with an appreciation for who he is, when he fills us with an appreciation for what he's done, 
then when he speaks to us about giving something up, it's easy to let go. It's easy because we, we do it by faith. Why? Because we know that he's a good father. We know that he loves us. He hasn't told you to step away from that thing because he's some cosmic killjoy. No, ultimately, it's because he knows what's best for you. So why don't you take a moment where you are, heads bowed around the room. I want you to respond in prayer. We're going to take a moment before the worship team leads us. Just take a moment. And I want you to ask the Holy Spirit. It's a dangerous ask. But ask him if there's anything in your life that's hindering the fullness of the work of the Spirit of God in you. Ask him if there's anything that that's grieving his spirit. Or maybe today God's already been speaking to you about giving something up and you're just holding on to it. And in your holding on, you're hindering the work of the Spirit of God in your life. And so I want you to take a moment before we worship and you just respond to the Holy Spirit. If he's highlighting something, again, maybe it's something he's been highlighting for some time. Maybe you just need to pray, God, give me the, the strength to do that. Give me the strength to release that thing. Give me the strength to trust, Lord, that in following you, that's where the true joy is. That's where true contentment lies. So take a moment. Ask the Holy Spirit to maybe highlight something. Or if he's already highlighted something, you ask him for the strength to release that thing to him.